Retina Rounds, episode number 130. Over the past few months, Retina Rounds has been receiving videos from trainees and early career vitro-retinal specialists asking for tips on how to better perform their cases. Today, we're going to feature one of these videos from an early career vitro-retinal specialist. The surgeon's patient has vitreomacular traction syndrome, which proves to be a challenging surgical case. And we want to thank this surgeon and others for sharing their cases for feedback. Part of growing as a surgeon involves critically appraising one's own surgeries, uh, and certainly getting feedback from colleagues can be helpful as well. So let's check out this case together, and if you have any suggestions or tips for this surgeon, please be sure to add them to the comment section. So this is a diabetic pseudophagic patient in her 60s who's previously undergone PRP for proliferative diabetic retinopathy, and that appears to be clinically quiescent. Uh, the patient also has a history of asteroid hyalosis. She presents with worsening vision to the level of 2060 and complains of metamorphopsia. Now you can see the OCT scan provided below, which shows uh, areas of vitreoretinal traction on the nasal and temporal aspects of the macula with a broad area of adherence over the central macula. The foveal contour actually looks pretty well intact, and the subfoveal outer retinal layers also look to be largely intact. So my first comments for this surgeon are to assess the degree to which the patient's symptoms correlate with the anatomic findings. And while there is some traction on the nasal macula, it's not affecting the fovea that much. Uh, an Amsler grid can be helpful to document where the distortions are and to what extent they correlate with these areas of traction. Now, the surgeon should also assess for other reasons that the patient's vision may have decreased. And the reason for this is that one of the management options here would be to simply observe. And in cases of broad vitromacular adherence and traction, as is shown here, and in cases with focal traction over the fovea, the decision for surgical intervention should start with three assessments. One is how much is the patient bothered by their visual symptoms? Two, do the anatomic findings really explain the patient's visual symptoms? And three, what is the trajectory of the symptoms and anatomic findings? And that last point speaks to the value of obtaining serial examinations to get a sense of how uh, this condition is progressing. And while a broad adhesion like this probably isn't going to spontaneously release, focal adhesions might, and close observation is certainly a reasonable option. Now, if you've monitored the patient, ruled out other causes of vision disturbance, and are convinced that VMT is causing the symptoms, or is heading in a direction where the symptoms may get worse, intervention can certainly be considered. Pneumatic vitreolysis, which is where an expansile gas bubble is injected into the eye to encourage vitreous separation from the underlying retina, has been reported with varying degrees of success. The DRCRNet protocol AG specifically investigated this technique, and while hyaloid release was achieved in 78% of eyes, there was a higher than expected rate of retinal tears and detachments, and so the study was terminated early. Regardless, in this particular case, uh, given the broad adherence over the macula, the history of PDR and asteroid hyalosis, I think pneumatic vitreolysis would not be a very good option. Vitrectomy is generally considered the most definitive treatment for this condition, and that's what was performed in this case. Okay, let's get started with the case here. You can see uh, the asteroid hyalosis that's present here. Uh, and as the core vitrectomy is being performed, uh, this uh, surgeon is going to try to segment uh, the vitreous 360 degrees, which is a, an approach that would be taken uh, with uh, most diabetic vitrectomy cases. You can see some of the uh, penretinal photocoagulation scars that are present in the periphery. And this process of going around 360 degrees can help to create some turbulence. It can create some uh, space for BSS that's being infused into the eye to uh, flow underneath uh, an opening in the hyaloid face and to allow some hydrodissection uh, of the vitreous. You do have to be patient when performing a uh, vitrectomy in patients who have uh, asteroid hyalosis. We've, we've talked about this in prior episodes, but patients who have asteroid hyalosis often don't have a PVD, and in fact, their vitreous may be uh, abnormally adherent to the retina, in addition to uh, the, the fact that this patient has a history of VMT and therefore probably has uh, an abnormal vitreoretinal interface encouraging the, um, the posterior hyaloid face to be adherent to the underlying retina. So in, in this case, uh, with a patient with asteroid, you have to be particularly, um, uh, particularly patient. And on top of all of that, this patient also has, um, has of course, diabetic retinopathy. And so we know that these, these eyes are often going to have skittic vitreous. So the combination of the abnormal vitreoretinal interface 
uh, and the vitreous geases here uh, can make uh, performing a vitrectomy and uh, elevating the posterior hyaloid uh, a little bit more challenging. And the use of triamcinolone uh, to confirm uh, uh, where the hyaloid face is uh, and to confirm that the hyaloid has in fact been elevated towards the end of the case will be very important. So you can see here the surgeon is using uh, the vitreous cutter to try to engage uh, the, the uh, posterior hyaloid proximal to the optic nerve and now is uh, moving the cutter away from the optic nerve, um, not quite uh, elevating up away from the retinal surface. So in this, uh, when, when using the uh, vitrectomy probe to induce a PVD, it's often best to use a J-shaped maneuver as we've shown you in prior episodes. So aspirate maximally at the edge of the optic nerve uh, and then uh, dr uh, follow the surface of the retina. The surgeon is doing a good job of that, but you do want to also uh, elevate. So you want to bring the uh, vitreous cutter up away uh, in an anteroposterior motion away from the underlying retinal surface to try to pull up the hyaloid and to try to propagate the PVD. Now the other, the other thing to keep in mind here in patients who have VMT is that they are at a higher risk for developing macular holes. Now that's gonna be a bigger concern in patients who have focal adhesions uh, uh, at the fovea as opposed to this patient who has more of a broad adhesion over the macular surface, but you do in general wanna be careful not to exert traction over the macula, uh, and so when inducing the PVD, you don't wanna be um, uh, pulling over the macular surface since that might encourage the formation of a macular hole. Now this surgeon is doing a good job of staying away from the macula, uh, but I would, I would like to see um, the hyaloid being elevated um, in this area uh, more inferiorly and also trying uh, nasally, so pulling away from the optic nerve to create some separation. It doesn't look like the, the, um, the vitreous cutter is really uh, creating that separation that the surgeon is intending. Uh, and so uh, rather than continuing to try uh, with the vitreous cutter, uh, I think it might be a good idea at this point to try a different maneuver, perhaps uh, staining the posterior hyaloid with some triamcinolone would be a good step right now just to make sure that you're actually engaging uh, the edge of the hyaloid proximal to the optic nerve with the cutter, uh, or you could then go on uh, to use uh, some, um, some intraocular forceps to try to pull up uh, the hyaloid if it's not coming with the vitreous cutter. Now the surgeon is uh, going to the nasal aspect of the retina to induce the PVD, which I like. I like working in this space away from the macula, uh, but it doesn't look like uh, the use of the vitreous cutter has been uh, very effective in actually inducing the PVD. So it's uh, probably time now to try a different technique. Now uh, the surgeon has finally uh, decided to use some triamcinolone, which I think is a very good idea at this stage, especially since the, the PVD induction just wasn't progressing uh, without the assistance of, of triamcinolone staining uh, and with the vitreous cutter alone. And now you can see uh, uh, this uh, dusting of the posterior hyaloid face. Uh, you can see multiple areas where the hyaloid is still attached to the uh, underlying retina. And, and, and this is now uh, going to be, I think, a far more efficient way of trying to induce uh, the PVD. And I do like the fact that the surgeon uh, used a dilute uh, concentration of triamcinolone uh, just to get some, uh, some dusting of the vitreous to assist in visualization. So again, it looks like the surgeon is, is trying to create some turbulence uh, with the, uh, the vitreous cutter, but that's not working. And now the surgeon has gone on to use uh, intraocular forceps. So I think this is a very good idea at this stage since the, the cutter hasn't been very fruitful um, using the forceps to, um, to peel up the hyaloid face uh, to create some separation. Again, that's once it's, this is, the posterior hyaloid is like a suction cup. So once you can uh, create an opening, oftentimes the BSS that is being infused into the eye will start to um, hydrodissect uh, through that plane, that opening between the hyaloid face and the underlying retina. The BSS will start to dissect that plane and will facilitate um, elevation of the PVD. Now, he, the one thing that I would suggest here is to consider using the forceps to elevate the PVD nasally rather than peeling over the macula at this stage. Um, although uh, doing this with the forceps is a little bit more controlled than had this been done with uh, the vitreous cutter. And now the surgeon, uh, having created some space, is going to use the uh, vitreous cutter to induce the PVD. And, and again, in this, in this instance, I would really like to see uh, the PVD induction happening away from the macular surface, so nasally where it's a bit safer and you're not gonna be exerting undue traction on the macula. 
Now, now with good visualization, with some separation created with the forceps, now you can see that the surgeon is actually able to uh, aspirate the hyaloid in the, in the correct uh, location uh, and is now uh, using that J-shaped maneuver uh, very nicely to, um, to follow the surface of the retina away from the optic nerve and then to elevate it in an anterior-posterior fashion to propagate the PVD. And you can see now that the uh, PVD looks like it's starting to come up uh, over the macula as well. Uh, now, uh, using the, uh, going back to the cutter to uh, debulk some of this vitreous and then again to use the, um, the turbulence that's created by the cutter to further propagate uh, the elevation of the hyaloid. So now you can see here, um, this aspiration is happening inferior away from the fovea, uh, and you can see um, pretty definitively now that the, uh, the hyaloid is up over the macula. Now the, uh, the challenge will be to con uh, continue to extend uh, the, uh, the PVD uh, peripherally. Now you'll remember that um, not only does this patient have asteroid um, and vitreomacular traction, which is, you know, these are things that are going to increase the uh, likelihood of adherence uh, of the vitreous to the underlying retina, uh, but this patient also has PRP. And so the PRP, depending on how hot it is, it may actually, uh, have, those burns may have been hot enough to actually fuse the, uh, the vitreous uh, to, uh, the, um, to the retinal surface in the areas where the laser is applied. So in these eyes too, it can be very difficult to uh, fully elevate up uh, the hyaloid face. And in some cases, uh, less is more. So it's best not to uh, pull too hard uh, uh, on the vitreous in areas where PRP has been done. If you can elevate it safely, that's great. But if it's not coming, sometimes it's best just to leave uh, the vitreous alone to shave it down as thoroughly as you can uh, and to uh, th thereby avoid uh, creating any uh, iatrogenic retinal breaks. So now you can see some of the, the vitreous that's still uh, adhering to the retinal surface using the vitreous cutter and slowly uh, propagating up the PVD. This is a very nice uh, maneuver, and I like that the surgeon is going slowly uh, so that they can visualize uh, whether or not there's any undue traction on the underlying retinal surface. That's going to help the surgeon to avoid creating an iatrogenic retinal break. Now, it looks like the, the hyaloid has been elevated at least up to the level of the, uh, the panretinal photocoagulation um, uh, in the inferior quadrant. Uh, now the surgeon is going to use uh, the cutter to try to elevate up uh, the hyaloid uh, in the superior quadrant. You can see here that aspiration right at the edge where the, the vitreous is still stained with the, uh, the triamcinolone. And again, very nicely, slowly elevating this up. Uh, you don't want to pull too hard and potentially pull uh, a retinal break. So now the surgeon is trying to use the cutter to elevate the hyaloid uh, on the temporal side of the macula. Um, just one observation here that overall the, the, the use of the light pipe has been good um, to uh, not only visualize the vitreous cutter tip, the, the vitreous, uh, and uh, also to visualize the underlying retina. So overall the, the illumination I think has been pretty good for this case. Um, now with the temporal retina uh, trying to elevate the hyaloid in this infrotemporal quadrant, certainly using the cutter and uh, getting underneath the hyaloid face, you do want to try to aspirate, not just cut, but actually aspirate uh, and try to lift up the hyaloid because the, the, uh, as has been uh, shown before in this case, just using the cutter to uh, create some turbulence hasn't been enough. The, the vitreoretinal adherence here is just too tight. And so you do want to uh, consider uh, aspirating here with the cutter. Now, the surgeon is actually aspirating here temporally and trying to elevate up the hyaloid, but this is not going to be nearly as fruitful as if the surgeon actually switched hands and then used the, the vitrector in the, in the left hand here to uh, get underneath the hyaloid, then aspirate and lift up. Because if you're sitting on top of the, of the vitreous and you're aspirating, as you're pulling, you're just pulling your, your cutter mouth away from the hyaloid, and so it's just going to uh, come out of the mouth and it just won't be a, uh, an efficient way of elevating, uh, elevating up the hyaloid temporally. So for this surgeon, I would recommend uh, really, uh, you know, getting used to operating with both hands this is very, very important to develop bimanual de dexterity. And so switching uh, the, the hand, the, the vitrectomy probe to the left hand here, I think will be a far more efficient way of elevating up the hyaloid temporally. So we're going to go ahead and fast forward through the case a little bit here just to get through it. But you can see the surgeon is still struggling getting this temporal hyaloid up. And so you know, there is something to be said for perseverance and, and, and being patient and continuing to try, but if you're getting to a point where 
the maneuvers that you're using are just not working to achieve your surgical goals, it's a good time to reassess and to consider a different strategy rather than continuing to do the same thing over and over again. So now um, the surgeon has decided to put in a little bit more triamcinolone. Uh, just as we had discussed previously, this is a good idea uh, just to try to get better visualization of where the hyaloid is still down. And actually you can see, despite all the efforts that have been, that have been, um, that have been rendered during this case so far, there's still quite a bit of vitreous that's still attached to the retina. So clearly this eye has um, you know, a significantly uh, abnormal, particularly tight vitreoretinal adherence. And so in this case, um, again, you may, may not be able to get all the hyaloid up. Uh, that has to be the, 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 the benefit of, of getting the hyaloid up and um, uh, theoretically decreasing the risk of vitreoretinal traction in the later postoperative period uh, has to be weighed against uh, the, the risk of potentially creating a break uh, by pulling on this hyaloid too hard um, in the retinal periphery where the retina is thinner and a little bit more prone to developing tears uh, in areas where there's prior laser photocoagulation and potentially also in areas where there could be some, um, some additional areas of, of uh, vitreoretinal adhesion, some fibrovascular pegs, uh, which may also uh, result in tearing of the retina if the hyaloid is pulled too hard. So I think at this stage, the surgeon has decided that they can do uh, as much um, uh, hyaloid elevation as they possibly can, and so they've opted to just go ahead and trim uh, the residual vitreous 360 degrees, uh, which is not a bad, uh, bad choice at this point. Uh, a significant amount of time and effort has been uh, exerted to try to elevate the hyaloid, and if it's not coming, uh, it's, um, it's probably not worth uh, getting more aggressive and, tr and potentially creating um, some iatrogenic damage to the retina. Uh, trimming back the vitreous here is perfectly acceptable, um, and uh, you do want to be as thorough as possible trimming back that residual vitreous. Uh, and the use of scleral depression you can see here is being uh, performed to try to trim that vitreous back. So here's the patient's post-operative outcome at month two, and you can see a nice improvement in the macular anatomy. Uh, this patient's vision and symptoms improved uh, to 2040, uh, and so overall a successful outcome despite how difficult the case proved to be. Now here's some take-home points. When dealing with cases of vitromacular traction, one has to consider the patient's visual symptoms, the anatomic findings, their progression over time, and any other ocular findings, like in this case PDR and asteroid hyalosis that have to be considered uh, when uh, planning for the surgery. And remember that patients with VMT have an abnormal vitreoretinal interface posteriorly, but often they have abnormal adherence peripherally, and so you have to weigh the pros and cons of how aggressive you want to be with removing the vitreous against the risk of creating a retinal break. Now, VMT eyes, and particularly those with focal adhesion over the fovea, are at risk for macular hole formation, so PVD induction away from the macula, particularly nasally, can help to minimize traction uh, during PVD induction over the macula and therefore hole formation. Now, last triamcinolone staining can be a useful adjunct to make the surgery more efficient. Now, with respect to this particular surgeon, first I want to congratulate you on a very nice anatomic and functional outcome. Uh, in addition uh, to inducing the PVD nasally away from the macula, the one thing I would recommend doing is to uh, practice more using your non-dominant hand, um, since uh, the elevation of the temporal hyaloid in this case probably would have been more efficient with the vitrectomy probe in the left hand. Now, less can be more, and I think your ultimate decision to simply trim back the residual vitreous after multiple efforts to propagate the PVD was reasonable and probably the safest approach. Now, for the Retina Rounds community, if you have any tips for the surgeon, again, please leave your feedback in the comment section. For the surgeon, thank you again for sharing this case. And for any other surgeons, if you would like to submit your cases for feedback, please do so on the Retina Rounds website. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please visit us at retinarounds.com. There you can sign up for our email list. You'll get a notification every time a new video is posted. And if you have an interesting video or a tip or trick that you'd like to share, please follow the links on our website and you can upload your video there. Thanks so much for watching.